Wake up. It's the Sleep Unplugged podcast, episode 59, Bedtime Rituals, right on time. Welcome, everyone, to this episode of the podcast. My name is Dr. Chris Winter. I'm a neurologist and sleep specialist and your host for the show. If you're new to the Sleep Unplugged podcast family, welcome. If you were a veteran, welcome back. It's been a big week. We had a lot of fun last week with the lucid dreaming episode, which we'll touch upon here in a minute. As always, if you want to get in touch with the show, you can find me via social media, DR Chris Winner Twitter, DR Chris Winner Threads, DR Chris Winner Instagram, and DR Chris Winner TikTok. We put all of our episodes of the Sleep Unplugged podcast on YouTube, and you can find that on the Sleep Unplugged YouTube channel. You can always get in touch with the show via that method. It was a big week last week. Um, our previous episode was on lucid dreaming, and I thought it would be a lot of fun. In particular, I put two supplemental videos on Instagram. One was some tips on how to inst uh, on how to lucid dream, which was a lot of fun. And showed off my impressive CGI skills, particularly the foot floating over the ground. But the second was the video challenge I posted where we attempted to do a mass lucid dream experiment in honor of Dr. Robert Van de Castle, who is a sleep researcher extraordinaire and a buddy passed away several years ago, but he did experiments where two individuals would try to lucid dream on the same night and go to the same spot to find each other in a lucid dream and convey information. And it was a very difficult experiment to do because you had to give one party information that, and you had to make sure that the other party wasn't privy to that inf information you know, by you know, beating the system, I'll I'll tell you what the thing is, and we'll fool this investigator. So it was very hard to set these these up. So I thought it'd be a lot of fun because only I knew the object. So in the lucid dream experiment, we were all going to lucid dream ourselves in front of the Colosseum. So I chose the Colosseum because it's very well known, and people can kind of imagine it in their head. Plus, I love to travel to Italy whenever I can. And I was holding an object, and your job was to figure out what that object was I was holding, meaning that you would lose a dream, go to the Coliseum, find me and look in my hands. And if you saw me holding an object, you were gonna report back. And a lot of you did. Now, there's a spoiler alert coming up. I'm releasing this episode Sunday at midnight. So if you want one more shot to figure out what it was, you might wanna pause the episode before you move forward. But if you've Tried it Friday and Saturday night and 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 want to know the object was an apple. And at least Friday and Saturday night, I was able to lucid dream myself in front of the Coliseum. In fact, Friday night in my dream, I was standing in front of the Coliseum holding an apple. And as I turned around and looked back at the Coliseum, there was a massive you know, painting, probably the size of one of the arches in the Colosseum of an apple. And I remember thinking in the dream, that is a really ugly painting of an apple. But if you looked up and saw a painting of an apple, that would have been impressive. And I appreciate everybody for trying it. Everybody for guessing. We had cell phone, we had toaster, we had all kinds of DM messages of, of guessing. So I, this was so much fun that I think every August as part of summer vacation, we will do a massive, massive lucid dream experiment somewhere fun in the world. So next year we'll travel to Paris and we'll all lucid dream ourselves in front of the Eiffel Tower, or we will travel to some other fantastic country uh, we'll go to Peru and, and, and go to some ruins there. We'll find some great places to go, but we'll pick really well-known spots and we'll lose a dream and try to try to convey that information. So you all have a year to really get good at lucid dreaming. And I will keep my practice up as well. If you need a great book, there's a book called learn to lucid dream by Kristen Lamarca. 
who I mentioned in the last episode. So fair warning, a year from now, the Sleep Unplugged podcast will be lucid dreaming ourselves in front of some other well-known artifact, the pyramids in Egypt or something great like that. And we will try to convey information in a dream. So if you didn't figure it out this time, no problem. You got a year to prep. So we'll use that. We'll, we'll skip our uh, typical comments, corrections, criticisms, since we've mentioned a few people and their guesses uh, with the Lucid Dream Experiment. The title of the song today, Right on Time, is from one of my favorite artists and a really amazing person. I go back and forth. If somebody said, look, Chris, I can arrange for you to have a have dinner with, have a cup of coffee with, have a beer with a famous person. Who would it be? To me, it's always between Bob Seger and Brandy Carlisle because I just think she seems like such a cool person and and really a fantastic individual. She actually spoke at my daughter's graduation and just was awesome. And when I think about live performances, particularly over the last, you know, what, 10, 20 years, that really blew me away. Her performance of the joke during the 2019 Grammy Awards, it was the 61st Grammy Awards, is unbelievable if you haven't seen it. And um, she was very nervous doing it, apparently, and she picked one person out of the audience and stared at her the entire time. But it is a phenomenal live performance. But anyway, that was um, the joke was off of her um, album, By the Way, I Forgive You. Her most recent album, that was her sixth album, her most recent al album, her seventh album, In These Silent Days, um, the song Right on Time is on there. And she performed that as well as Broken Horses, which is another single off that album on Saturday Night Live. And if you're interested in another amazing live performance, there you go. So uh, hats off to Brandy Carlisle, seven albums, nine Grammys, 25 nominations, a real superstar. And I'll be very excited to add her song to the Spotify playlist. So if you're new to the podcast, if you go to Spotify, you can find volume one, all the music we mentioned last year, and we've already started volume two. It's up and available. So it is the first Monday of the month. So that means we are covering a topic related to insomnia. And I thought a real fun topic and a real practically helpful topic would be the topic of bedtime rituals, which we really talk a lot about in children. And there's a pretty decent body of evidence and body of research around elderly individuals. But for the average individual who's healthy and, and, and sleeps well, or for those of you who are struggling with your sleep, there's, there's sometimes there's a little bit of a, a lack of, of emphasis that's put on these because they seem like things you would do with the child. Okay, we're going to have dinner and then we'll do bath time and then we'll do a little door the explorer and then it's time to be in our bedroom and we're going to brush our teeth and comb our hair and we'll you know, get our stuffed animals organized. This is what we used to do with my daughter and they had to be sitting in certain places and we would read stories and we got to choose three stories that we would read and, you know, they would always end on good night moon, you know, whatever. So those rituals are nice because for a young person, they're sort of serving as a roadmap for what is to come. You know, as the bath goes to Dora, goes to brushing your teeth, goes to reading the stories, the brain sort of knows and takes in that information and it lets it know that sleep's on the way. But I, I think it goes even deeper than that. So this episode is going to lean heavily on some episodes we've done in the past, namely episode 14, which was on circadian rhythms. Because when we talk about bedtime rituals, we're really talking about the circadian rhythm. And this goes back to research decades and decades old from a researcher we talked about in that episode, Jurgen Ashoff, uh, who wrote in 1978, he, he had an article in the, uh, it was D Die Naturwissenschaften, which is uh, natural sciences, please excuse my German pronunciation. But basically, he came up with this idea of zeitgebers as their relationship with 
the circadian rhythm, meaning the circadian rhythm is something that we have intrinsic to all of us. And it's operating on about a 24 hour rhythm. So what is a Zeitgeber? So we have this innate circadian rhythm and it is a gene expression that is happening regardless of our environment to some extent, meaning that it is a, about a 24 hour period, which we talked about in that episode. Um, so what we do to sort of modify that timing is that we expose ourselves to these Zeit givers. So Zeit givers are external or environmental cues that entrain or synchronize that biological rhythm usually to entrain it to the earth's natural 24 hour rhythm. So I think the example we gave in the circadian rhythm episode is you've got, you've inherited my son. One of my sons has really gotten into watches and, and really finds them to be, you know, look at this Rolex or look at this watch that was specifically designed for early pilots. So instead of having to use a pocket watch when they flew an airplane, it was strapped to their wrist. That's the reason why the wristwatch came into being is what I've been told. I'm not a watch expert. So now they could see what time it was as they flew the plane and not have to let go of the controls of the airplane. So he's gotten really into watches. Well, imagine inheriting an heirloom watch that didn't keep that great of time. Fine. Just means that every day when you got up, looked at your cell phone and saw the precise time, you might make a fine adjustment into the, oh, we're five minutes ahead or we're seven minutes slow here. So you would adjust your watch and move on with your day. Imagine what would happen if you had that watch, but never made that adjustment where you would be months, if not years from now. So it's important for us to have the ability to adjust or entrain the circadian rhythm, which is not exactly 24 hours. And that's what Jürgen Ashoff really coined. He coined this idea of a Zeitgeber or time giver in German. So when we think about our circadian rhythm, that is a gene behavior that is operating on a prescribed amount of time, like a heartbeat or a menstrual cycle. Like there is a time for this biological rhythm. And that timing can be modified with Zeitgebers. So the more robust our entrainment with these Zeitgebers, the better our circadian rhythm functions to align our body with the 24-hour cycle of the earth. So strong entrainment, strong Zeitgebers equals better predictive behavior, just like the watch. You've got a meeting six weeks from now and you're wearing that old vintage Rolex, whatever watch, and you don't ever look at your cell phone and change that time, you're, you're not going to be on time for that meeting. And if you are, it is going to be through the dumbest of luck versus every day you make those little adjustments. Six weeks from now, when the meeting happens, you will be there on time. That's the predictive behavior of the circadian rhythm. And we're talking about insomnia, right? This is insomnia Monday, first first uh, Monday of the of the month. So why do I care? I don't and we're not, meetings and vintage watches and brandy Carla. I don't I don't really care about this. I, I'm struggling with my sleep. How is this helping me? Well, it's helping you because sleep and sleepiness, is something that we want to be predictive. Wouldn't you like to, instead of falling asleep after lunch when you sit down to read the newspaper, fall asleep tonight at 11.30 when you go to bed, when you want to fall asleep. So we are looking to maximize our circadian rhythm, to maximize the predictive behavior of our bodies to happen and create sleep when we want it to. Remember, Insomnia is not an inability to sleep. What is the first part of the definition? It's an inability to sleep when you've decided you want to, part A. Part B is you're upset about it. So forget about part B, which we talk about a lot on this show. Let's focus more on part A, which is, well, I'm working on feeling okay about being in bed awake. How can we deal with part A where I can just feel more sleepy and time my sleep more to where I want it. 
And that's what we're talking about here with the circadian rhythm, with sight givers and bedtime rituals. So when we think about the, the circadian rhythm and we think about chronotypes, are you a night owl? Are you a morning person? Our ability to create structure in our sleep is enhanced or hindered by the zeit givers. And what research, research has shown is when the zeit givers in our life are weak, then we tend to have issues related to the predictive nature and the um, ability for sleep to happen when we want it to. And as zeit givers become weak, we start to see a much bigger expanse of the human chronotype, meaning let's get a hundred people into the office. Um, let's meet with a hundred people. And these are people that just kind of work out in the community. Some don't work, some have kids, some don't, just a, a, just a mix of people. And let's start looking at their sort of demonstrated chronotype. Oh, wow. These people over here are super night owls. And these people over here like to get up at the crack of dawn and get going. Like you would see a big span of chronotypes based upon an average selection in the population. Now, let's not use an average population selection. Let's think of some individuals who have very strong zeitgebers in their life. And when I think of that, I think of the military. I think of the United States Naval Academy, beat army. Um, I'm just kidding. I, I, we, we love all armed forces. I've got a, a son who's finishing up at, at Navy this year. So we're we're very pro-Navy in this family. But when I think about the Naval Academy, ooh, I think of extremely strong sight givers. Now, let's get a hundred midshipmen together and let's talk about their chronotypes. You're, what you're going to find is because of the strength of their sight givers, the span of their chronotype is going to be much more narrow. Not a lot of night owls it there you know not a lot of people who like to get up around noon now maybe they were prior to entering into bancroft hall walking onto the yard but as the zeit givers in their life become stronger so too does the narrowness of their circadian rhythm and the predictive nature of their body's behaviors including sleep and that's what we're really looking for when we think about bedtime rituals. So let's think about bedtime rituals. What are we talking about here? And I've listed a few here. Uh, deciding on a set bedtime. So you're gonna your ritual is that you're gonna go to bed at a certain time, eleven o'clock, whatever. Putting away electronics, having a snack or a bedtime tea, uh, taking a warm bath, listening to music or something of that nature, stretching, breathing, meditating, yoga. Now, a lot of these things we've talked about, we've done episodes on yoga, we've done episodes on food, we've done episodes on temperature, uh, still haven't done one on electronics per se, but that's coming. Um, practice meditation, writing in a journal, reading a good book, watching television, um, doing a, some sort of to-do list or a list of worries. And then finally, maybe preparing your bedroom, entering your bedroom, getting into bed and going to sleep and what, and what that environment looks like. With kids, you know, there may be some extra things in there as well too, but it's about the same, you know, adults and kids. And so when we think about these things, what are we really talking about? Well, you know, perhaps deciding on a bedtime really has a lot to do with light. You go into the bedroom, you're turning off lights. Uh, putting away electronics, maybe the same thing. Stress, reducing stress because phones often bring stress with them and reducing light. So we don't want phones in our face when we go to bed at night or any kind of electronics. Um, a snack or bedtime you know, tea, that's sort of food, what we're consuming. Maybe with something like tea, you're getting some temperature in there as well too. Taking a warm bath, I think that has everything to do with temperature manipulation and maybe reducing stress, listening to music, maybe reducing stress or something other. Uh, stretching, breathing, relaxing really has more to do with exercise, meditation, journaling, reading a good book. Again, more and more you know, stress reduction and, and, and sort of ritual. So when you start to look at the bedtime rituals, what you start to see is they're playing upon aspects that are considered zeitgebers. They're playing on things that modify a circadian rhythm. These are zeitgebers right? 
So just looking at your watch and seeing that it's 11 o'clock does nothing. That means nothing to your brain. We have to enter into our brain in that circadian rhythm via some sort of modality or sensory input that has meaning within the circadian rhythm. Now, when you think about that, the number one most likely is light. And we talked a lot about light in episode 23, that when we start to dim lights in our home, turning off televisions, turning off computers, or putting the little blue blockers on, or you know, turning the brightness down on our screens, what we're actually doing is diminishing light in our environment because light, as it enters into our eyes, has an interplay with the chemical melatonin all through our suprachiasmatic nucleus and pineal gland. So a very strong Zeitgeber has to do with light. And we talked about Nathaniel Kleitman and Bruce Richardson in the Mammoth Caves in that, in that circadian rhythm episode that they were trying to figure out what is going on with our intrinsic circadian rhythm when you take light out of the picture. And what they found was it, it continues to run. It's, tw it's 24 hours and some change, right? It doesn't matter that the light we expose ourselves to up and down every 24 hours is a strong Zeitgeber to modify that 24 hour plus rhythm that we have inside all of us, that genetic expression, that rhythm. So I'm going to step away from light just because I think that's the obvious one, right? We want our rooms to be dark. I think sleeping with a sleep mask is a really fun experiment to do. Ever tried one? You have a lot of people say, well, I hate sleep masks, but they've never even worn one. Get a sleep mask, wear it for a week or two. There's so many people who will never go back to not wearing it. You know, sleeping in that extremely dark environment is really positive when it comes to sleep. In fact, I just was talking to a family member who overslept a meeting. And I was like, what happened? They said, well, I was staying with somebody and the guest bedroom was pitch black. I woke up at 11 o'clock and could not see my hand in front of my face. It was very disorienting. We had the same situation in my home growing up when my parents redid their basement. They built a bedroom in the basement of my childhood home that had no windows. So if there was a fire, you were stuck. However, the best place to sleep. It is like a cave. I mean, it is completely without light even in, at midday. So you can really get some decent sleep there. So let's set a light aside. Understand that it's probably the most talked about and strongest sight giver there is. So lots of light when we wake up, lots of light during the day, eat your lunch outside. All those things are great. When it comes to sleeping, you know, around dinner time, around the time when the sun is going down outside, we really want to eliminate and reduce light in our environment, turning off lights in our bedroom, turning off lights in our living room, using bulbs that don't put out a lot of blue green light. If you have to have light there, wearing your blue blocker glasses or something that minimizes light in your eyes, if you have to be on your computer, because those things can make a big difference. So let's move on to another Zeitgeber that we talk about sometimes, which is exercise. Now, we've talked a lot about exercise on this show. Uh, we talked about it in the episode where we were exploring ways to deepen sleep. Um, we'll do other, other episodes about exercise. I want to do one specifically on weightlifting. We've talked about yoga uh, in two episodes ago in episode 57. So exercise is fantastic for sleep. But one of the things I think is really important to understand is it's not just about the exercise creating sleepiness. Like, wow, I really worked out hard today, so I'll sleep like a log tonight. It's really about the exercise serving as a zeitgeber, as one of those entrainment cues for our sleep. And there was a great study that was done. Um, it was a Swedish study in 2019 called Circadian Rhythms and Exercise, Resetting the Clock in Metabolic Disease. And what this study showed was that exercise can be used as a tool to combat metabolic disease, not just because of the exercise and the calories burned and all the good things we think about when it comes to exercise, but that also the timing of the exercise, if it's consistent, can actually help to coordinate and strengthen an individual's circadian rhythm, which has its own health and sleep benefits. So 
if you're somebody who exercises, great. When do you exercise? Is it whenever I can? Or I start every day off with, you know, an hour and a half of cardiovascular, you know, running and some weightlifting. And it doesn't have to be first thing of the day. It's really about it being on some sort of schedule. So doing some sort of stretching, yoga, light exercise in the evening, we always talk about, well, you can't exercise at night because it'll wake you up. Sure. Yeah. Maybe vigorous exercise right before you go to bed, certainly do that. And this is something I deal with a lot with pro athletes. You know, they have this incredibly intense, stressful, you know, sporting event, and it's hard for them to come down from that. But if you're somebody who can exercise and it relaxes you, you can get your body fairly cool afterwards. There's a lot to say that that exercising of your skeletal muscle has a very strong influence on your circadian rhythm, particularly if it's happening, you know, at some point in the late, mid to late afternoon. Um, so again, I want you to think about exercise as something that's intrinsically helpful to anybody whenever you do it. So I would never say to somebody, well, if you can't exercise in the morning or can't exercise mid to late afternoon, don't exercise. That's, that's absurd. But just thinking about your 24 hour day, when is exercise happening and how consistent is it? Because the consistency of that exercise can be a part of a ritual that is going to make it easier for you to fall asleep at night. The next thing I want to talk about is stress. Stress is often looked at as a zeit giver, meaning that when you think about your day, you wake up. I'm assuming most people are relatively relaxed. You get into your day and as the day goes on, it becomes a bit more stressful and it's difficult and your job is hard. And then all of a sudden the day is over and you go home and hopefully the stress levels come down. But I know for a lot of people, it probably doesn't. You come home to a house full of kids and You've got to get dinner on the table and sign permission notes and help with homework. And there's, you know, the cats, the dogs vomited on the, in the kitchen. I'm just going through my own life here. It's not hard to find stress in one's life, but it has been shown that stress can actually be a sight giver. So having sort of that push and pull of the day, do you have periods where you are of high stress? Do you have periods where your stress is lowered? I think is really important. We don't want to be people who are constantly stressed. However, and this is my own thought. I'm going to step outside of scientist Chris, and this is kind of observer Chris, that one of the things that I see when people retire is you, you're, you're suddenly losing a lot of circadian anchors. You can go to bed whenever you want to, wake up whenever you want to. You don't have to go to work anymore. In addition to losing that schedule, you also lose the stress, don't you? You know, you're no longer teaching. You're no longer preparing people's tax returns. You're no longer a you know colonel in in the army and with all those responsibilities. You're just hanging out, waiting to grill some steaks that night. And I think that when we lose that stress, it can be negative. So I yeah, I tell people all the time: look, if you're going to retire, retire. But you've got to fill your life with something that A, keeps you on a schedule and B, challenges you. So you don't have to have the stress of being the full colonel that you had when you're in the military, but it would be great if there was still some push or pull in your life. And it's not entirely known how stress interacts with the circadian rhythm. It's thought to entrain that rhythm via glucocorticoids, which are chemicals we make when stressed. Uh, sympathetic nervous system output. There's oxidative stress, hypoxia, meaning your oxygen levels are changing, changes in pH, cytokines. We have to do a lot with um, immune modulation and, and, and regulating um, inflammatory responses, as well as body temperature. So when we think about lowering stress at the same time every day, you get in bed and you read. You get in bed and you journal, or prior to bed, you are meditating, or you're watching the new season of Real Housewives of Orange County because that's your, ah, I just want to de-stress and see what uh, these women are up to and, and how they're going to be truly awful to one another behind their backs. Um, that's great. I mean, if that's your way to de-stress, that's fantastic. You should be doing that. But having these periods of low stress 
happening before we go to bed as part of the bedtime ritual can be a great way. Again, it's not about I'm going to sit here and meditate or I'm going to write in my journal and that's going to knock me out. That's again, we're not nothing about this podcast. If you're somebody who says it takes me seven hours to fall asleep is going to knock you out in 20 seconds tonight. That's not what we're trying to do. And if you're trying to seek that, you have a lot of past episodes you need to listen to, but it's really about coming up with structure, right? Where every night, okay, right after dinner is when I start to really like to wind down, do some meditation. I do a little bit more right before I go to bed and I do it every night. That's the kind of thing that cumulatively, in addition to the exercise, in addition to the light exposure, is really going to make a big difference in terms of individuals and their ability to fall asleep when they want to. Temperature is another Zeitgeber that is much more difficult for us to understand. In fact, when you look at research on light as a Zeitgeber versus the known research on temperature as a Zeitgeber, it's tough. In fact, a lot of the temperature research looks at other organisms, not humans. It's much easier to study. In fact, there was a great paper, I think a very important paper that came out in 2018 called Circadian Clock Neurons Constantly Monitor Environmental Temperature to Set Sleep Timing. And what that study was looking at was in the fruit fly that basically said, we have found mechanisms within the fruit fly where they are constantly measuring environmental temperature and the fluctuations in that temperature that we should see, but we often don't because we live in air conditioned homes, that those fluctuations in temperature can be a huge determinant of our circadian rhythm and our sleep patterns. And that those neural mechanisms, while they've been worked out to some degree in organisms like fruit flies are still not well understood in humans. However, I think that we can manipulate those in a way that can be very easy and helpful, meaning get a smart thermostat. And after dinner, the environmental temperature that you're seeing starts to go down, just like we were all living outside. You know, we're out there hunting prey and living in a cave. And all of a sudden, you know, as the sun starts to go down and it becomes dark, it's getting cooler. We got to get the fire going because we live in a place where there's lots of temperature fluctuation. And as that temperature goes down and our body temperatures go down, it's a natural trigger for sleep. So we've talked it all about that in our temperature episode, which was episode 25, about how important temperature is to sleep and how we sleep better in cooler temperatures. And if you look at that 24 hour body temperature curve, it's circadian, right? And remember we talked about as that temperature starts to rapidly drop, the point of most rapid drop is the place where we tend to want to fall asleep. So if you're a night owl, that temperature drops later. If you're a morning person, it's earlier. So again, that circadian entrainment, when we see light, when we experience and minimize stress, when we eat, when we exercise, all of these things and temperature can really influence the predictive nature of that, of that curve. So we talk about food to meal timing, which I find to be really interesting and, and something we think about a lot. And, and that's a little bit easier, right? It's easier to sort of introduce consistent meal timing maybe than it is to manipulate temperature through a 24-hour period. And, and this all has to do with the concept of what's been coined chrononutrition, which chrononutrition to me is I've got two groups of identical people and I've got bags of the same candy bar. And I'm going to give group number one, the candy bar every day at three o'clock in the afternoon, I'm going to give group number two, the candy bar at all different random times. And I'm going to look at insulin sensitivity, blood sugar response, and other sort of endocrinological and metabolic measures. And I'm going to bet the group that's eating that candy bar at the exact same time every day is going to see a much minimized impact on their body's health with that candy bar than the group that eats it whenever they want to. So this idea that it's not just what we eat, but when we eat it, that determines a lot about health, particularly when you look at cardiovascular health uh, and diabetes. I think those two things have been worked out extremely well within this idea of chrononutrition. Um, it was like, you know, skipping breakfast and eating late 
we know puts you at risk for diabetes and heart disease. So it's that, that, that timing matters, not just necessarily eating healthy foods, eating healthy foods at the wrong time can be a problem. But as we think about sleep, we can think about bedtime rituals and bedtime routines of eating that snack. Yeah, we've talked about in our episode about food, different foods can promote sleep a little bit better than others. So we don't want to eat the plate of spicy chicken wings right before we go to bed because the, the, the intrinsic nature of that food is probably likely to impair sleep, you know, hard to digest, it's spicy, it's, you know, all kinds of bad things are happening. But having the timing be relatively consistent and thinking about that is really where the ritual is at. Um, and there's actually, back in the 80s, there, you know, we talked about circadian rhythm, the suprachiasmatic nucleus and light. There's actually something uh, referred to as the food and trainable oscillator, which, which means that there is a part of our brain that we can entrain based upon the timing of food. Now, the timing has to happen within 24 hours, meaning you couldn't eat today and eat three days from now. So you, you have to have sort of a 24-hour schedule of eating. But that food and trained and trainable oscillator can act as a zeitgeber and entrain the circadian rhythm. It's not as strong as what light does, but it certainly can exist within that space. And something that we can manipulate, just like we were talking about in children, to help improve sleep as of individuals, individuals going to bed. So eating your, you know midnight snack of some yogurt and some nuts and some dried uh, tart cherries prior to going to bed at the same time every night is something that can act as one of those circadian zeitgebers to help us with our sleep when we go to bed at night. And I would throw out there eating all of your meals around a 24 hour cycle at around the same time are all going to entrain that circadian rhythm, just like you're at the Naval Academy, make it stronger and make that predictive nature of when you go to sleep much stronger as well too. And it was Mistelberger, I believe back in the 80s, I think it was mid 80s that, that came up with the, um, uh, the food and trainable oscillator. I'm gonna throw one more thing in there, um, which is, I'll just put it under the category of other. And other is interesting because we often talk about, you can't do that thing before you go to bed at night. What's a big one? TV. Can't watch TV before you go to bed at night. You, we talk about this in the tired sleep advice episode. It drives me crazy. People say, well, can't watch TV two hours before you go to bed. Of course you can. Just be consistent with it. Now, obviously the light is going to have a consequence. Being on your phone will have a consequence. Listening to music will have a consequence, you know, in, in terms of some of those things. But anything that we do consistently during a 24 hour period or during a midnight bedtime ritual can be a, a, a zygib or a time cue. I mean, it could be anything. I mean, it, it, things that you would think might, might work against sleep, you know, intercourse before you go to bed. Well, if you're consistent with the timing of that and you and your partner like to do that right before you go to bed at night, Sure. That again, that's a zygib. It's something that's happening on a routine, predictable basis every 24 hours prior to bed that's serving to entrain the circadian rhythm. So I'll just point out really quickly, there was a, a study, and this was back in 85, um, in Journal of Music Theory called The Effect of Music Therapy, Music Therapy and Relaxation on Adrenal Cortical Steroids and the Reentrainment of the Circadian Rhythm. And essentially, basically, they were looking at nurses and they had this sort of music listening protocol and showed that over time that the individuals who were exposed to music had a much more favorable circadian rhythm amplitude, that their corticosteroid release which must re was much reduced. So that's sort of de you know, sort of a marker for lowered stress. And their temperature rhythms were significantly more entrained when they listened to the music. So the thought was, hey, listening to music as well as any kind of you know, relaxation technique or something like that could be something that could strengthen the circadian rhythm. So anything that we do in that prior to bedtime category, as long as we're consistent about it, could really improve and enhance sleep. So what are the aspects of your own bedtime rhythm? What things have you found to be helpful? What things have you thrown out with the bedwater? What are you doing right now 
to make your 24 hour circadian rhythm strong. So it's able not only to predict when you're going to go to bed at night, but everything that our, everything that our bodies do to be healthy. I want to hear about it. So DM me, DR Chris Winter, Instagram, DR Chris Winter, TikTok, DR Chris Winter, Threads, DR Chris Winter, Twitter. Uh, you can find us on the YouTube Sleep Unplugged channel. Um, I think that's it. My book's The Sleep Solution, Why Your Sleep's Broken, How to Fix It, as well as The Rest of the Child are out there and available. Uh, I hope you all sleep well. And until next week, Sleep well.